Can I smack it? Yeah. 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 Cool. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Amazing. We're off. Yeah, we're off. I'm a star. Uh, do you the market? No, it ruins, it ruins the optics having it on the table. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it ruins the optics. <laughs> Does it really? Uh, that's what, what Fabio says, and I trust Fabio. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the latest edition of the Author Hub See You One Do One podcast, brought to you in association with all those open access journals that let you publish absolute Pretty horseshit. much anything. <laughs> yeah, for a, charge a few hundred dollars, minimal oversight. You know who you are. Um, and following on from that slick segue, Pete, what are we talking about today? Cash, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. It's about research. Oh, fuck. God. I'm afraid so. Really? But we could not have, as unthinkable as that sounds, and as tedious as everyone's like, oh, God, maybe I'll give this one a miss. No, don't, because you couldn't. <laughs> 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 we couldn't have two better spokespersons, spokespeople, for the topic. Old oh, Portonet is here. <laughs> <laughs> Come with the bios, old boy. Let me do the bios. So today we are joined by two titans of orthopedic academia, two bona fide <laughs> academics. So, Pete, by the way, Dan called us the Ant and Deck of orthopedics, the cheeky oh, fucker, yeah. <laughs> um, which must make them the Harry and Meghan of research. <laughs> you can decide which is which. So we take our research very seriously here at Authorhub. And so the first hit on Google this morning from Matt Costa reveals that you are an American singer-songwriter from Huntington Beach, California. Oh, right. Right. I'm called Goose. I had no yeah. idea. I'm a surf bum as well. Yeah. <laughs> it does actually moderately annoy me that he's top of the Google does search it? list. Yeah, I don't know why. From one the... day, one yeah. day, you'll so trump him. He's most well known for the hit song Lullaby from the Curious George soundtrack. Unfortunately, we don't have that guy. He sounds fun. We've, <laughs> <laughs> We've got the other Matt Costa. Uh, Matt's a professor of orthopedic trauma for the University of Oxford, actually, having previously been a professor of trauma and orthopedics at Warwick. Not many people know this, but Matt is heir to the Costa Coffee fortune, which is why he can also afford to do charity work <laughs> as a consultant trauma surgeon at the John Radcliffe Hospital <laughs> in Oxford. Matt's research interest is in the clinical and cost effectiveness of musculoskeletal interventions. Is that right? That's right. Is that on your business card? <laughs> I haven't got a business card. Oh, and no. I've never actually got a free coffee in Costa. Have ever. you never? Never. Not That's once. Outrageous. No, I actually, yeah, I do put my name down as Costa when I'm in Starbucks, and that doesn't go down particularly well. <laughs> but I've, I've never, no, not once. Even when I showed, I showed my ID badge at one point, and still. Well, no, no. That's no, outrageous. Yeah. Not, not a coffee. Do you know who I am? You yeah. must have uttered those words. Yeah, and I even put my, uh, you know, hospital ID badge out. And <laughs> yeah. Just a blank look of indifference. <laughs> Matt is a chief investigator for a series of uh, randomized trials and associated studies supported by grants from UK NIHR, the National Institute for Health Research. Matt is the chair of a whole bunch of very important sounding NIHR research committees I won't bore you with. Um, <laughs> he's associate editor for trauma research at the Bone and Joint Journal. Is that right? That's right. Uh, past president of the Orthopedic Trauma Society and past president of the Global Fragility Fracture Network. It's a big deal. Matt's been involved <laughs> with many large impactful trials with colorful acronyms such as CRAFT, DRAFT, FAME, FORCE, FRUITY, HUSH, SCIENCE, Stiffy. <laughs> <laughs> Boner. Uh, traffics. Uh, UK style whist and the white four, five and eight. I'm assuming there's like a three or six, seven and you're just not doing those. There's also... Um, Was there a fixed team there somewhere? Oh, is there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Loads of them. 13 trials. The game, right? And the white series, yeah. yeah. It makes it very complicated well, though. It does, yeah. That's why we have to put numbers on them. So, yeah. Yeah. so we ran out of stiffy. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite wall... <laughs> My favourite of all of them is WISE, which stands for Wrist Injury Strengthening Exercise. If ever there was a trial that Pete Bates is perfect for, <laughs> you guys have really missed a trick there. And the first hit on Google for Dan Perry is for a dentist at Rancho Dental in California, who, and I quote, has enhanced and beautified many smiles in San Diego and Riverside County. But you'll know I did just clean my teeth before this. You did, did you? Clean, fully polished. Yeah. But unfortunately, we have a different Dan Perry. Oh. One who's not beautified any smiles. But he's most well-known for his appearances on CBBS, Children BBC. Really? Uh, yeah. Amazing. The hit TV series Operation Ouch, oh. where he's been the trusty sidekick for Dr. Chris and Dr. Zand. Those guys are awesome. 
Uh, in, as an aside, generally, their impact on health promotion has been massive. Yeah. And it's really, uh, they didn't get the credit they deserve. Their ability to explain something is just glorious. I saw, saw them explaining how, you know, how a cough and a cold works. And they had yeah. like, they had like mucus pouring out the sides <laughs> of their mod. It was brilliant. Yeah. It was just. But did you see them explain trials? I didn't. Net. They, they, oh, I did on your, it's your yeah. pin tweet. It's on, yeah, it's my yeah. pin tweet. It's amazing. They explain trials to kids and, and they're really, really good. The kids, exactly the kids really good. like it. Didn't yeah. you get them to do a message for your daughter as well? Yeah, yeah, so you yeah. Got, yeah, Dr. Chris did that. That is so, so, so my, cool. my, really super nice guys. My kids love them, and we're going to see their. They've got a station in the West End. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you could sort out a backstreet meet and greet. Oh, well. <laughs> a backstage, sorry, not backstreet. <laughs> backstage. <laughs> Backstreet's back. Yeah. No, there's a <laughs> people right. singing backstreet, a backstage meet and greet. Like, I'd go down to Super Dad. I need some brownie points. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you could. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try my hardest. I'll yeah. speak to them. Yeah. <laughs> Dan started off as a prestigious NHR clinician scientist after a PhD in epidemiology. Uh, he leads randomized g- global clinical trials in pediatric orthopedic surgery and pediatric acute care. His research focuses on epidemiology and effectiveness research. He has an interest in big data and clinical trials, and his work largely or not exclusively focuses on children's orthopedic disease. He's a surgeon at Alder Hay Children's Hospital in God's Own Liverpool, with <laughs> pediatric hip diseases and perthes in particular as your main interest. Yeah, loads of perthes. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. You're the national. Well, you're the national clinical advisor for pediatric hip screening at Public Health England. Mm-hmm. Specialty lead for orthopedic trials for the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Yep. Current ABC fellow. Uh, yeah. If it, if it ever happens because of COVID, it's been put back a few times, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're timed out soon. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too old. To be under 40. I'll be like 50 by the time it yeah. happens. Peds editor for the Bone and Joint Journal and sits on so many research committees for NHR and the British Orthopedic Association and the British Society for Children's Orthopedic Surgery that I gave up counting. Mm-hmm. He's a leading force behind many large impactful trials with such colourful acronyms such as BOSS, CRAFT, FORCE, ORCHID, SCIENCE and SHINE. But most importantly, the main reason they're here today is that they're fellow fans of the greatest football team in the world, the mighty no. Reds, Liverpool FC. Come on. Gentlemen, welcome to Author Hub Towers. <laughs> Matt, kick us off uh, with, uh, we're talking about research. So what was it that, that first hooked you into research? What was it that made you think, this is somewhere I, can, I could make my fortune, I could, I could end up doing something good? Um, entirely by accident, Pete, if I'm actually honest. Yeah, I, um, I was a crap medical student. I did very little of any work. So if you'd asked any of my sort of tutors when I ended up doing sort of academic stuff, they would have absolutely wet themselves laughing. So, Did you it, publish as a medical student? No, not at all. Right. Didn't publish anything until I was, uh, yeah, SHO, I think. Um, but then I just worked for a guy called Sam Dunnell at um, Norwich. And uh, a knee surgeon. Loves the patellofemoral joint, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't he? <laughs> he, did, oh, he did a lecture. I think he still does a lecture called the patellofemoral joint in the centre of the universe, which was just <laughs> kind of weird. But yeah. anyway, uh, and Simon was just an enthusiast. He, he said um, uh, he was involved with UEA when it first became a medical school. And he said that, you know, when I worked for him, uh, do you want to do a little research project? And uh, I was like, yeah, I suppose so. But I had no particular interest or aptitude for it. And... We started looking at rehabilitation after Achilles, and he was quite keen on putting people in splints. So we, we set up a little study, um, just a prospective case series, really. And then um, he seemed to work. He said, why don't we do a trial? And he introduced me to a statistician at the medical school who then took me on as his, uh, I was his PhD student. And I just kind of thought, well, this is actually doing the day job. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go and sit in a lab and bubble test tubes and stuff, because that's really dull. Um, but because I could do the day job of being a surgeon and seeing patients and actually also do research at the same time, so that clinical effectiveness research, then I thought this is actually really good fun. So no, it was no great aptitude or any particular burning desire to change the world in that, Peter. I kind of fell into it and then it turned out to be quite a good laugh and carried on from there. And isn't that, that, that is just such a recurring theme across the, the whole of life, <clears throat> isn't it? That people, uh, people who become great in whatever field they're great at, often they ended up there because it was the first thing they just got inspired by. Um, totally. Yeah. Is it fair to say that some, a lot of people who end up in research, they get uh, the thing that first, uh, they basically do a great publication that's very well received and has quite a high impact in the orthopedic community, and that's the thing that that triggers them. Was that was that the case for you? Was it was it was there a good publication that came out of it? No, it was the, of- the opposite, uh, really. So we um, when so it was part of the PhD I did, which was a terrible PhD in retrospect, but um, I, I just. <laughs> Learned a lot about clinical trials and, and working with the stats people and, and how actually clinical trials aren't actually delivered by surgeons, they're delivered by researchers. And you, what was your you PhD on? Sorry? On Achilles tendon. Okay. Uh, so rehab stuff. And 
We published a, a trial looking at accelerated rehab in the Bone and Joint Journal, or JBJS, uh, British as it was sort of back then. And uh, I thought oh, we'd change the world because everyone would start putting people in, in splints and get rid of the torture of Aquinas Cast and so on. And then about five years later, when I actually started working at Warwick, uh, one of the students on the master's course we ran did a systematic review <clears throat> and um, of the Achilles tendon rehab. And oh. I thought, well, you know, my paper will be right at the top. And she actually dissected a paper and said it was one of the worst studies that she'd ever read. <laughs> and, and it turned out that no one else had ever read it at all. So um, rather than changing the world, actually, no, no one took a blind bit of notice. So actually 20 years after that study, we finally did the big national star trial, which was the yeah. Achilles Rehab, which is exactly the same question. And that, that finally got published. And that, I think, has just uh, two years ago in the, uh, was it in the Lancet now, I think. And uh, that one actually changed. Exactly the same question. So it took 20 Same years. question, same answer? Yeah, same answer. It was basically, um, it's safe to put them in a splint. And you probably do slightly quicker rehab if you put them in the, and get them walking with full weight bearing immediately. Yeah. And hopefully that will change something. But yeah, that was that was 20 odd years of, of everyone I mean, ignoring everything geez. I wrote. So it was the opposite. I had no decent publication. But just to get an orthopedic uh, publication in the Lancet is, is <clears> a bad that is That is pretty special, yeah. yeah. Well, it's the, the big multi-centre stuff is, you know, that the big journals, the general medical journals, that's what they, they like. So yeah. it's um, all of the big studies I think we've done, is that fair, Dan, to have actually ended up in the big general medical journals because uh, those journals want things that change clinical practice directly. So it's actually a relatively yeah. easy sell. Was yeah. it was it the New England Journal of Medicine, wasn't it, that published the hip fracture trial? They've just, um, I'm not sure, on, uh, oh, health, Mo's yeah, one. that was Moe's yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, They've yeah. just accepted one of ours. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that, really. I'll probably get arrested. You were, I think you're allowed to say it's accepted. You're not it's allowed accepted. to tell the results. We, so. by, the time we've edited, <laughs> by the time we've edited and released this, it'll, yeah, yeah. it'll be a year from now. <laughs> it'll be 20 years. <laughs> You'll have two-year follow-up, so don't worry. <laughs> Dan, same question to you. Where, where, where did you kick off? Where, where did research bite you? So, so again, it was kind of an accident. So, so I was, uh, I, I wanted to do peds ortho. Um, and so I was a first year registrar and I was put into peds orthopedics, which is kind of a bit weird as a first job, but, but I kind of, that, that's what I wanted to do. So my program director put me there early. And at that stage, um, a chap called, um, John Monk, um, who had a prosthesis, yeah. he, he died. Um, and because he died, there was a legacy fund, which, um, from the, from the prosthesis, which was there to fund some research for someone. So at the time, my my boss, Colin Bruce at the time said, look, you know, do you want to do any research? I've got no idea how to facilitate it, but you know, you could, you could use a bit of that money to, to do some research. And so I kind of went, all right. So I, I, I did a PhD and kind of just made it up myself. So um, yeah, so it was, it was yeah, there, there was lots of adversity. There was loads of people saying, like, I went to the professor of orthopedics at the time, and he said, you know, you're, uh, you're an orthopedic surgeon, you don't do PhDs, don't Again. do that. Yeah, so I went to the professor of pediatrics, and she went, you're an orthopedic surgeon, you don't do PhDs. So in the end, I, I got my own kind of group of supervisors together from one from London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, a couple of different epidemiologists. So it was kind of really hardcore kind of a science group rather than a, an orthopedic. Right. So you, you weren't inspired into it. You were you kind of dragged yourself into yeah, you it. You were battling for it. You were like, like everyone's saying, forget it, buddy. Yeah. And you were like, no, I'm going to do this. But and that just makes me. it better, doesn't it? Yeah. That just makes it even stronger. <laughs> so, uh, no, but it was, so it was really, really fun. And like uh, there was loads of great people along the way. But, um, but I think because because I didn't have an orthopedic kind of uh, any orthopedic mentors at that time uh, as a as a research guide, then it actually made my science a bit stronger because there was a chap in London uh, called um, Professor Sir Andy Hall who, who'd done his PhD about Perth Age disease 20 years before and so I just wrote to him and said you know please will you you know help and, and like he did he bent over backwards to help me so um, yeah so so yeah, he was doing malaria research at the time some sort of funny funny infection research at the time and he was like head of the the UK immunization board and stuff but but you know he, he bent over backwards to help me and that was um, really good so so I learned loads of really strong methods so you guys are both be considered trialists. You're both running uh, big multi-center trials, and you're, that's that's your your recipe that you've got going now. What what is it? How do you decide on a trial? What 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 ideas when you're running a dragon's den for ideas and you're trying to like get get the next big thing that you're going to do? What is it that 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 you think there? Yeah, that's an idea. What turns you off? What turns you on? Yeah. So I'm. So I am um, decided. Um, quite a long time back, actually, with a lot of encouragement from my colleagues to never have any ideas uh, of my own, because when I had them, they were generally either just bad or dangerous. So, um, uh, or both. <laughs> or both, yeah, occasionally, occasionally both. Yeah, dangerous um, ones are usually bad as well. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, uh, so all of the ideas are come from the trauma meeting each right. day. So it's the you know debate we all have every day about well, yeah. what do we do with that one, mm. uh, how are we going to treat this patient, or and it's those questions the one that we all ponder every day. And it, and then it occurred to me that shouldn't we know the answer to all this? And you scratch you know as you guys know you scratch beneath the the surface of the literature and it, it's There's all nothing there. utter nonsense. Yeah. We, we make it all up. So um, that's where all the ideas come from, really. So it's not it's not anything to do with me. It's to do with you know what what questions we answer, and then we then we sift the literature to see if there is anything out there at all, and then usually we then have to run a feasibility or a pilot trial to get some data to to actually fuel the study design for a big trial, and it comes from there. So, yeah, I mean comparing wires and plates for the wrist was the first really big study we did a few years back now, and and that was a, a question that was still asked in the clinic, even though all of us had kind of drifted over to wielding the plates. Then some people still, some of my senior colleagues still quite like putting wires in. I was like, well, surely someone must have done a proper big study to do this. And it's yeah. like, oh, well, then no, they hadn't done no, it. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no new ideas at all for me. You've had ideas, haven't you, Dan? So. Uh, kind of, well, I guess so. so. So my PhD was about Perth AIDS disease um, and it was about <coughs> the epidemiology, so looking at like incidence rates and stuff. Um, but it kind of became... So the incidence or prevalence? Uh, it's incidence. Okay. Incidence. <laughs> Just What's the difference? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> come on, man. It's yeah. elementary. One's a rate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've got, to, we've got to dump it down because Pete's the only non-academic here. Um, <laughs> he's feeling highly inadequate. So, <laughs> so, so my, 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 I'm going to melt into my chair. <laughs> <laughs> so my PhD was kind of looking at the, the kind of simple stuff, like, like how, how, how frequent, should we say that instead? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how frequent the disease is. But, but kind of that, doesn't change like, like what's it's helpful to know how frequent something is uh, it wasn't actually looking at how to treat anything so it wasn't actually of, of real value I, I didn't like it, it was useful but not of real value to people yeah. um, and so that's why I moved into trials and so so the the, the trial I've always wanted to do was a Perth AIDS disease trial um, about w w whether to do surgery or not about containment yeah about containment so um, and, and the reason that I started doing trials was to do a Perth AIDS disease trial and I always said that when I do that trial I'm going to retire because that's going to be the end of it mm. but unfortunately or fortunately whichever way you look at it that trial's just been advertised by an right. So, uh, right. so my retirement's going to come first guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be amazing you are done yeah, but I don't know how I'm going to afford to live anymore but <laughs> so, um, so that's why I kind of moved into it and so, so you said that's always been the idea that, that, that I wanted to do and then we've you know we've, we've I kind of worked up by doing a really simple trial f first about wrist fractures or torus fractures in kids the kind of fracture that no one really cares about in the nicest possible way yeah but it got surgeons and got people on board and randomizing and, and yeah. got together a group and then we then we set up a big observational study called boss which which ran at 143 hospitals so it got a really big network of kids orthopedic surgeons to to start thinking about research and then from that we've just started to, to make it more and more complicated by putting in trials and make the trials more and more difficult mm. and and this is where we are with the Perthish trial which is which is it you know that's the that's the big one for me yeah and the thing you've been really good at i must say you're really good at, you've been really good at infographics and uh, illustrations and kind of little animations i've been really impressed with those yeah no so i i think that's i think that's really important so so i worked so after my phd i went to work um at warwick university with with matt and damien so mm -hmm. um, and so uh, damien griffin who was who was the kind of professor at the time and and they both taught me different things about how to get on in research and and so matt taught me that you, you need to be really collaborative and you know have a really good network of, of mates around the country doing the stuff you do mm -hmm. and then damien taught me that branding was really important um and so so everything that that Damien did so before you know before he'd get anyone in a room he'd, he'd, he'd come up with a trial logo and come up with the the kind of the everything had to be on very thick paper because it makes people believe in it mm. so that's why I go really big on branding because I think it's really really important I can yeah I see you with your yeah. author hub top yeah, <laughs> so, yeah but a thick piece of paper is very reassuring isn't yeah it? exactly very, oh, okay okay yeah. now, we've, so now it, I've landed it's the science is it the science logo of someone's holding a, a bone yeah 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 is that you that picture no so everyone thinks it's me yeah. so, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put it on the screen now for everyone can see. So, yeah. Yeah. But it's really cool. so egotistical because it's really cool. Because do, do you know there's that app that makes makes things sing, like makes makes faces and yeah. things sing. So I've done that for the science logo and put that on Twitter as well. And it looks like he's singing away. Right. It's brilliant. But it's not you. No, it's not me. But people, okay. everyone thinks it's me. Yeah. So uh, so so that's, no, fine. That, that's just uncanny. <laughs> um, listen, one one quick question in the history of NIHR. Have you ever heard of anyone handing back a couple of millions of pounds? worth of unser unused research funding. <laughs> no reason, I'm just asking for a friend. I'm just asking for a friend. 
Is that a thing? Oh, you made my leg cramp up now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on swiftly. I, I don't know where you're going with this cash. No, no, no. Um, Matt, listen, I'm not cred- crediting you with uh, inventing the pragmatic trial, but you certainly helped <laughs> popularise and normalise a concept in the UK, Wolf, Draft, Fixed ET. Um, I'm sure you've heard this many times, but pragmatic trials have come under some criticism. Mm-hmm. What's your response to the accusation that pragmatic trials are powered in such a way to show that orthopaedic surgery is no better than non-operative management? Basically, why do you hate orthopaedic surgery so much? <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem? Yes. I, 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 well, made, I made Cash reword that. Say, <laughs> What's your response I to the knew accusation? Where that? <laughs> I knew where it was going to go, where it was going to end up. Why do I hate it? Um, I've got enough work. I've got more than enough people to operate on every single day. They're queuing out the door in Oxford, <laughs> literally, to, to, with their broken bones. And I think we operate on too many people, and there's plenty of other things to be doing with our time. And it's not like we're going to put people out of work. But there it? is an argument that some of the studies, some people argue that studies are designed in such a way that the <clears throat> inevitable outcome is you're going to find there's no difference. Well, we do. I mean, if you answer the, if you pick the right questions, half of them should have no difference so it would answer so is something superior or not so if we're if all of the trials show there was a difference between stuff we're, we're answering obvious questions we shouldn't do that, that yeah. trial. it's only where there's a balance of uncertainty that we need to do the trial uh, the pragmatic thing it's really interesting so people you know bring this up regularly not the hate hating surgeons thing <laughs> well, that's that was an ad lib <laughs> <laughs> But it's um, and it's almost like uh, he hasn't people started think, on the patello ferro joint yet. Yeah, he got, got there. Getting, getting to that. That was good. That, that was good trial. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So people seem to uh, suppose that there's um, uh, some sort of uh, argument between uh, effect efficacy trial, so a, a full on experimental design where you're trying to work out what the the best possible outcome from an intervention is, and the pragmatic trial. But they're, they're just um, different stages in the development of an idea or an intervention. So when we start off testing a new intervention we do an efficacy study so we take an expert surgeon in an expert center under ideal conditions with a highly selected patient group and then we try and work out how big the effect of that intervention is in under ideal circumstances and that's once you've done that then you get an idea of is this intervention worth testing on a larger scale Mm -hmm. but that study as has been replicated so many times in the literature doesn't necessarily turn into benefit across the board so in an expert surgeon's hand they can make this intervention work beautifully but actually, when you roll it out to, to the rest of us, mere mortals in the, uh, across the country or indeed around the world, it doesn't work in the same way. So the pragmatic trial is really to replicate what practice is in reality on the day-to-day in the NHS, which means lots of surgeons of various experience and various skill sets and various levels of training and so on operating in less than ideal circumstances on patients that are not highly selected because that's the truth of how we work. So... We, it's not that we don't do a fixity trials, we do, but actually the question that really needs to be answered by for society is how does this intervention work in the generality of the healthcare system, not in a super specialist centre with specialist surgeons. So where does that leave? Because because what then happens is the, um, the, the the trial gets published. It shows that actually, although this works well in the specialist centre, it doesn't work quite so well when everyone's having a go at it. So across the generality of the NHS, <clears throat> it's probably there's not much difference between A and B. And therefore, that then makes its way into, a, into an NHS guideline, into a nice guide or a national guideline. And so it's almost like the specialists are being, are being, are being punished. Now, I'm not, I'm, punished is the wrong word, but you, you know what I mean? There's almost being sort of... Disregarded. I mean, it's almost as though you're kind of disregarding some people's specialist uh, yeah. practice and skills. Sure, but we don't do trials in those areas generally because they're not the big questions for society. So we, we did plating or wires for, for risks or recently just about to publish the non operative non operative because yeah. we hate surgeons um, <laughs> uh, which yeah I won't spoil that one but you can probably predict um, <laughs> so uh, yeah and you know those questions are what everyone does every day so that's what yeah. that's the stuff we're in if we're talking about you know some uh, super fancy nerve reconstruction break or plexus sort of surgery well we, we don't do trials because the sensible thing to do is to send those people to a smaller number of centres where they are experts yeah and that doesn't need well you couldn't run a trial under those circumstances yeah. nor, yeah. nor yeah. should you try yeah. so the interventions we're testing are the things that are done every day in everyone's practice they're not the super specialist things what's become clear is that when we've got because we picked off some low-hanging fruits you know hips and wrists it's not just because they're 
really interesting is because they're really common. Common, yeah. yeah, yeah. But when we've gone for things that are a little bit more esoteric, then it becomes more difficult because the surgeons in particular get more invested in those procedures. So when yeah. we did distal tibia, which is, you know, that it's that, it's that give a shit case on the list where, you know, you have yeah. to concentrate. Yeah. You know, most of us operate most of the time on brainstem, brainstem level, alone. talking yeah. about the football during the surgery. And you know, patients on the spine get unnerved. Why, why are they not concentrate? But actually, if it's going well, you're talking about the football yeah. and it's all going smoothly. It's when it goes quiet. And you yeah. Have, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, <laughs> there's a, you, you have that one case on the list. And the distal tibia, because of that, very, very easy to mess it up. Yeah. Was a bit more tricky. So that was a real sell. And I, I thought we'd bitten off more than we could chew with that with that trial because um, I didn't think the surgeons would buy it but amazingly they they did and in the end of it we got a clear result in favor of actually nails which is actually probably technically more difficult procedure in the in the bottom end of the tibia and the flare and mm. and then it was a case well now we need to train people to do that operation well because it seems to have benefits uh, and yeah. if you can't if you're not confident doing that send it to someone else um so yeah I don't it's not that we're saying you know not everyone should be operating because they're not good enough to do this it's just you know, know your know your skill set and if yeah. you're not confident doing it send it to someone who, who is yeah. but draft was a good example because that alienated some of the upper limb community oh felt, some of the hand surgeons are still cross yeah <laughs> who felt they knew the answer or that you know in their hands it was very different mm. whereas when you've done let's be honest you've done uh, guidance that will benefit them across the generality of the nhs and so, how did you find that dealing with the upper limb societies and hand surgeons? Yeah, no, it's um, it's so it's it's difficult because um, actually most of the hand surgeons were absolutely lovely. I mean, Joe Dyer's really looked after me when I went to the hand society to present that. I mean, he was my <laughs> he was my he was my walking shield, really. Yeah. And the problem is that a few people who were very vociferous about it and, and actually just fundamentally believe that plates are better, and it's almost a faith thing. And you can't argue with that. And I've given no, it a try. No, no. So, but actually, most people are like, oh, it's fine. And so it was, draft was really, I'd learned loads because, I mean, you're learning all the time as you go along. But what I've learned and learned more from Dan, actually, is, is selling the results is actually just as important as delivering the, the trial, how you pitch it. Mm -hmm. So I spent about six months talking to people about the draft results and, and why not everyone needs a plate on their wrist. Uh, and then I spent about a year and a half talking about the exclusions to draft and why I still use plates on people. So yeah. <laughs> we didn't say chuck the plates out. We just said, well, if you can get an anatomic re a reduction, then you will put wires in and hold that reduction. It will yeah. do fine, funnily enough, because if it ends up straight, then it will probably do quite well. Whereas there's loads of other wrist fractures that you can't reduce clothes that we still put plates mm. on. But no one, everyone said, oh, you just said, don't use plates. No, no, we didn't. We said, use plates when you need yeah. to. I actually, yeah. I like draft because I love a K wire. And so actually for me, it was, it was great to have that. So thank you. Except the next draft may upset you then. Just I can't say that. I can't say that. Cut that. Cut that. Draft, cut, 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 cut. Unless it's been published. Yeah. <laughs> draft two has been cancelled. Dan, what's your role as a researcher? Is it to guide the masses or is it to try and influence the subspecialists? Uh, to guide the masses. Um, yeah. I, I think... Um, so it's difficult, isn't it? Because I'm a kids orthopaedic surgeon, so we're already fairly specialist in what we do. Yeah. And more and more of the trauma, kind of more and more pediatric trauma goes to pediatric orthopaedic surgeons now anyway. So so it is a fairly specialist group of guys. But, you, you know, kids kids trauma is really, really common. So so I guess it's a bit of both. Okay. Um, so and different different ones in my trial, diff, you know, influence different people. Like the kind of wrist fracture stuff is obviously yeah. very general. And then the, the, the Perthay stuff is very specialist. So yeah, absolutely. Actually, one thing before we move on, Matt, I was going to say, don't, don't, please don't ever fucking do anything on ACL. <laughs> <laughs> just stay away stay away, stay away yeah. Yeah. I know the answer so please <laughs> <you don't. laughs> I'll be so, yeah. homeless yeah I think some of it's our problem though isn't it because we, we come up with these operations and we just start using them and then we teach our fellows and they, they, they teach people and then they yeah. kind of you know just emerge and they've never Absolutely. been tested and then we're surprised when it doesn't work you know and, and if it was a drug we're not, never... we're not talking about ACL reconstruction <laughs> yeah. ACLs are amazing okay. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, but if it was a drug, then uh, then you'd never be able to just start using a random new drug, you know. Yeah. Then, then you know it has to go through so much testing and things. So, so it, it's kind of all our own fault, and it's it's you know perhaps we should be regulated better. Perhaps we sh you know, that that's really going to upset people, isn't it? But perhaps we shouldn't be able to just make up a new operation all by ourselves and, and just think it works because that's crazy. Like, how are we consenting that? No, patient? and one of my uh, when I was a trainee, one of the consultants, Ridley and Thomas, always said to me, "Beware the rep with a new implant." Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and that's how a lot of things come into practice, historically. Matt, what's, your, what's the closest you come to a death threat? 
<laughs> it's funny, yeah. I was uh, threatened with KYs at the hand side. <laughs> <laughs> Death uh, by KYs. 1.6 millimeter KYs. <laughs> that would be, a, be a slow and painful, wouldn't it? <laughs> it a thousand stabs. Um, yeah, no, I haven't actually. It's slightly like, disappointing. I wasn't be doing things. Um, we've had a, a lot of, you get a lot of angry correspondence. It's really, so one of the trials recently that I, I published actually led by Becky Carney, who's a, a research uh, professor at um, uh, Physio at uh, Warwick. Uh, was the um, Achilles tendon injection PRP yep. trial. Mm. And I thought, you know, I mean, who who really cares? Um, but I got published in, in JAMA, and the vitriol from the sports medicine people, particularly over the pond, was really quite remarkable. So Becky was saying, what do I do with all this on social media? So that's why I'm not on social media, because of this <laughs> stuff. But you're proper, yeah. full-on, you know, people not just angry, but... Yeah. Pr- you're not on Twitter, really you're not on Twitter, are you? So the, the group do. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I know I'm behind the times and Dan always rolls his eyes, but I, I hate him. It's fine. Well, happily, I'll put your mobile number on the screen right now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone wants to t- WhatsApp or call Matt, <laughs> feel free. No, I think my name does appear on there. So you can, anyone's welcome to tweet me or whatever, but I, I'm not... You'll never ever read it. Dan, you've you've now started going multinational, I understand, with your, with your um, uh, trial development. I guess that brings a whole new level of pragmatism, does it? Uh, so, so a lot of things, so a lot of things haven't really changed. So, we're taken, we've taken the UK trials, and firstly, we've opened them in Australia and New Zealand, um, and that's we've, so we've stuck stuck to the, exactly the same protocol and exactly the same everything, um, and that was kind of pretty. It was actually easier than we thought it was going to be to, to open them and get them on board, and they've they've been really good. So, for the kids' trials, it's really important because kids' trauma kind of stops in winter. Um, whereas obviously down under it's uh, it's summer, so just to keep recruitment going through 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 our winter, then it's yeah, it's yeah. amazing to have them on board. Uh, and we've just got an NIH grant as well, um, so a US NIH grant, uh, which is really really cool. And that's to to essentially do the same trials, so craft about distal radius fractures and science about um, uh, medial epicondyle fractures uh, throughout the US, which is really cool. And they're, they're essentially taking our protocols. Uh, they've tweaked them a wee bit because because they're American. Can I say that they're, they're American? Yeah. They've got to change something, yeah. but um, but but they've <laughs> they make um, it better. They, they've made it better, obviously. Yeah. But um, but no, I mean it's it's more or less the same, and you know the the endpoints are the the endpoints are pretty much all the same. So. But do you think it's easier because paediatric orthopedic surgeons are generally nice people? We are to, nice people compared to most orthopedic surgeons. I, I think it's really helpful. Um, yeah. so so kids orthopedic surgeons on the whole uh, are nice guys, and they've all got really behind the trials. And you know there yeah. is a bit of controversy like craft. Craft, do, you know, causes some divisions about really nasty wrist fractures, kind of doing nothing to, you know, let remodeling take yeah. its course. So, um, so, so there is some division, but generally people are behind it. And yeah, as you say, kids orthopedic surgeons are nice people. Yeah, less sociopaths. Yeah, but you ultimately though, uh, health health systems are different. They have different pressures. They have different funding. Yep. Uh, and so you you we you, you want your you want your research, depending on who your funder is, mm-hmm. uh, you want your research to ref- to be relevant to the population you're dealing with. So how do you convince someone like the NIHR to fund something that's going to go further? Or do you have to have get their national bodies to pay for it in the, in the different countries? Is that how it works? Uh, so so NIHR pay for the stuff that's happening in Australia. And well, they, they pay a large extent to what's happening in Australia and New Zealand. We've got a little bit of extra funding from Starship in New Zealand to, right. to help it to help it work there. But 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 essentially the, the the populations in those two countries are you know we're all fairly similar to to Australia and New Zealand so right. the results likely to reflect um, um, practice in in that country as well. Yeah. It, it may be a bit different in the US, which is why we have tinkered with a few things. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and they're, they're never they're, they're likely never to believe our result because you know they believe that they're all athletes and you know or, or you know baseball players and, and all of this sort of stuff. So so our result in science may be different to the US result, which is one of the reasons they want to reproduce the trial themselves to see exactly what's happening. Right. Um, but but yeah, you're right. Trial results are you know depend on the population that they've been tested in. So how would you publish that? Would you publish those two two parallel trials running side by side, hopefully showing the same thing, or do you combine those two together? So or a bit of both. Uh, so. So, so we're, we're, they're, they're both independent trials, so we'll publish them separately. Hopefully, the UK one will be published first because the US one's only just starting now. So, right. so we're we're we're, uh, we're we're into science. We're already kind of two years into recruitment. So, I'm kind of hoping that we're going to beat the US. Yeah. Um, and if I don't, I'll be a bit sad. Um, <laughs> so, um, so we'll, we'll publish them independently. But but because the, all the outcomes are the same, and um, we'll do what's called an IPD, which is yeah. an individual p- um, patient data meta analysis. So you, you do uh, clump all the results together and and, and do a right. do a, a further analysis with a bigger population to, to get a more definitive answer. That's something we've got a bit better at lately, isn't it? These actually planning ahead. To, yeah, yeah. Uh, part of the results is to 
so we almost invariably will update the, the meta-analysis and yeah. plan that analysis with the results of the data, often even before we publish the trial. Right. So for instance, we'll work with, for the WOLF trial, we work with Cochrane um, during the trial. They had first access to the data with permission of NHR so that the updated Cochrane review came out almost at the same time as the trial did. And, and Dan's very good about, you know, liaising with the various systematic review groups to, to make sure that the data is, you know, readily available for that. Yeah. It's interesting, all the countries you mentioned, obviously English speaking, mm -hmm. that you mentioned there, any reason not to include countries that aren't that different, like France or Germany? So a lot of it's about the outcome. So, so the primary outcome that we use is a, a patient reported outcome called Promise, and it mm -hmm. hasn't been necessarily translated into to, um, a, lots of different languages. So it's available in English and, and kind of Spanish, but, okay. but it's not available widely. And, and I guess the other things about funding, yeah. particularly uh, particularly after leaving the EU and stuff, there may have been more opportunities with us in the EU for for trials across Europe. Um, but but I think leaving Europe, I, I think that's that's kind of made that a little bit more complicated at the moment. Um, and also our group have never done it, so we, we you know we've we've opened in Australia, New Zealand because yeah. NIHR have got a relationship with with Australia and New Zealand yeah. funding body. So uh, but but no, I think it'd be great to. But watch your space; it could happen in the future. It could be amazing. It could be uh, global. We're doing it, yeah. We've got quite a bit going on in Southeast Asia actually. Mm. With starting to do that, NHR's sort of taken on some of the funding through overseas development aid to look at global health stuff. So we've been working with some fantastic people uh, in the Philippines and Thailand and uh, so on. So um, we haven't actually set up trials day yet because the infrastructure doesn't really exist. So we spent quite a lot of time working out how we could deliver the studies, but hopefully be able to do a bit more stuff yeah. there, which actually, if you talk about impact, where well, you know, we tinker around and maybe save the NHS a few quid and maybe change a little bit of how much someone's wrist or foot moves. But the big wins are actually in, in the you know, low and middle income countries where actually access to surgery is very limited. Hmm. And what, what we don't appreciate we've got, we, so we, we keep talking about NIHR, so the National Institute for Health Research, but, but other countries don't have that. So the reason that a trial costs so much in the US, like $6 million we've got for, for, the, for the two studies we're, we're running, the reason they cost so much is we have to employ people in each hospital to make it work. Whereas in the UK, okay. we've automatically got research nurses that are funded by the NIHR in all of the hospitals. So you can just say, oh, I want to start this trial tomorrow in whichever hospital and there's, a, there's someone there to, to kind of kick it off. It, it may not always feel like it if you're trying to set it up, but there are people there that, whose job it is and they're yeah. funded by, you know, by the national body. So, so that's amazing. That's an amazing network we've got, which is why we can deliver these trials and other countries can't. So I'm mindful of the fact that we have a, a global um, listenership um, <laughs> Sounds a bit, a bit up my own ass. Uh, a lot of it people, really a, lot of, did. a lot of people, in a lot of countries. This is how he talks all yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, in a lot of countries listen to the podcast, so I don't want to make it just about the UK. I always assume the NIH in the US was NIHR. Is it not the same thing? Uh, so it's so it's it's a big funding body, but, but yeah. they they're not set up in the same way. They they don't have that that pre made infrastructure at all the different hospitals because right. you know hospitals are funded very differently over there. Yeah. Um. So so no, so, so it's very different. I, I'm sure the you know I'm sure the funding's equally massive, but in the UK the the NHR budget's about one percent of the total NHS budget. So 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 it's huge. I think I'm right in that. Aren't I? I'm yeah, making it's that a bit more now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's um, so it's really really massive. It's a it's a mm. it's a huge infrastructure we've got, which is why we can do it. Even more since Pete gave the money back. Yeah, exactly. Again, <laughs> <laughs> again. <laughs> We all know that in order to become a, a good at anything in life, but surgery as well, is to, is to do lots of it. And we are, as a specialty, are a little bit perhaps over obsessed with being a good surgeon, being a, you know, I'm a good driver, I'm a good surgeon, you know, I'm a good lover and all of that. But maybe that's... Are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yeah. Just put really? that in there. Are, are you above average? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Show me on the bell-shaped curve. <laughs> If I'm a trainee and I'm coming through um, and I'm wanting to be a great surgeon, I aspire to be a great operator, but at the same time, in order to pursue research, I need to do a PhD and take three years out. How It, it often seems that being a great surgeon and being a great researcher, it almost they're pulling you in different directions. Where are, you, where are you going with this? Yeah. <laughs> no, what are you I, trying to say? I, I get enough of this uh, <laughs> at Oxford from my yeah. colleagues. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just stayed at work. Yeah. 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 I, I want to talk about you, Matt. We, we were coming to you in a minute. <laughs> I, I was talking about how do you how do you square that away with trainees who want to be great surgeons, but they also know in order that, that in order to become a researcher, they're going to have to take some time out. 
Are you suggesting that academics can't operate? Is that where this is going? That is not where this is going. Okay. That's, that's exactly what my um, my colleagues in Oxford regularly say. Like to taunt yeah. you with. Or the proper surgeons, as they call yeah. themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, you do, you take a hit, don't you, I think? And uh, I was very lucky early in my training back in the, in the day. I did lots and lots of operating because that's what you did. So you used to spend all weekend, every weekend sort of operating. Yeah. But uh, and it wasn't particularly training, but there was an awful lot of holding the knife. Doing. So I never, I never felt hugely that I was taking time out away from it. And also, while I was doing, back in the old days, before NHR even existed, the, the funding was extremely limited. So I, I paid for my way by doing lots of operating while I was even doing research. So I, I didn't feel I missed out on that, but I know a lot of people do. Doing the clinical effectiveness research, I told myself that while I was in clinic and while I was operating, I was actually doing research because people were in trials, but actually I was just doing the day job. So if you're taking time out to spend three years in a lab away from it, then it's a real that's a real deal. And I, I probably in the past have underestimated how acutely the trainees feel about that and how separated from that clinical work they feel. But um, yeah, you definitely take a hit. And I don't do, I don't do, I do half as much operating as my proper surgery colleagues. So yeah. And that all means is that I just don't do everything these days. So I mm. gave up doing P and A stuff, and I don't do frames. And you know, I'll, I'll take yeah. on most of the rest. Just I've been around for a while, but you know, I let the other guys do the stuff right. they're really good at. So you, you've narrowed your practice in yeah. order, in order yeah. to. Yeah. Stay- I, mean, I just do trauma, uh, and of course that keeps you, as you guys know, it, that I, one of the reasons I love it is because you, you get to do everything. But um, I don't, I don't do the niche super specialist stuff anymore. And I, I, you just have to accept that you know those guys are better at that than me because I spend more time doing research. Dan, uh, I'm very similar. So my practice is, is very limited now. Uh, t- so I do. I look after the kids with Perthes disease. I do DDH and I do bone cysts, which is a bit of a random niche. So uh, so no. So so so, so yeah. I've, I've narrowed my surgical practice down, and, and I've got really supportive colleagues that you know. If if for a lot of the the big pediatric cases, we generally operate with two surgeons anyway. So that's that's also kind of helpful that, that there's always another opinion, and you're kind of bouncing each uh, ideas off each other. But but you know it, you do take a hit you know you, I, I spend loads and loads of time doing research and, yeah. and I'm very aware that that I'm not as you know because of that I'm perhaps not as as uh, certainly not as experienced in all those operations that some of my other colleagues are. Yeah, so yeah but the irony is by by limiting limiting is the wrong word by uh, narrowing your focus of practice actually you're really shit hot at what you do. I, I'm, and, yeah, for Perthes disease in particular, I'm yeah. you know, I, I, and bone cysts and bone cysts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very very specialist. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, um, it, it, it's kind of funny. It's kind of weird how it happens. Um, but if I prove that Perthes disease, you don't need surgery. I'm kind of doomed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will have to retire. <laughs> <laughs> but but just going to the next stage there. So you back back with the trainees. I'm not really talking about you guys, but. but when, as a trainee, you, you see this a lot. People come through their PhD, they take three years doing their thing, and then afterwards, they're almost like, oh my God, I just want to get back to being a surgeon again. <clears throat> and then they go off on fellowship, and then they're just so enjoying being an operator, they often don't go on to become clinical academics, they go to being full clinical, and actually often do very little research in the future. Yeah, so I, I'd say, I don't know about you, Tom, but I, I spend much more time these days persuading trainees not to do a PhD than I do persuading them to do one. I take on very few PhD students these days. The truth of the matter is you don't need a PhD to get a job in a good centre. You need to be a good surgeon, a good colleague. Um, yeah. You don't need that. And so for me, the only reason for doing a PhD at all is if you're seriously considering working for a university because yeah. that's the unit of currency there. And mm-hmm. if you don't have one... You don't yeah. get the job too easily, but other than that, the PhD is completely useless. So don't take three years out. You can. I think all trainees should, and most, nearly all of them want to be involved in research. But it doesn't mean that you have to do a PhD or take time out. They can be recruiting into studies, and you know, randomising patients and measuring outcomes as part of the the day job. Yeah, the thing that's interesting now is with the um, CCT criteria, um, re- recruitment of five patients into trial now counts towards your criteria. Yeah. As m- uh, almost not quite more so much as a high degree and so actually there's so much value to be gained from understanding research from being able to you know understand and critique a pa- read a paper which you know p- is still an art that people struggle with well that, that, i think that was one of the biggest steps forward and orthopedics really led the way on that some you know amar rangan in particular but lots of people involved in that process of changing the alcp mm-hmm. to stop putting pressure on trainees to publish things they didn't want to publish and that no one wanted to read and now, as you quite rightly said, paying for the privilege of publishing it. So moving away from that to actually being involved with research by taking part in a big multi-centre study uh, is a massive step forward, I think, for research and for the trainees. Because yeah. 
and it those most of those papers my god i've polluted the literature with a lot of crap in my time but you know, <laughs> most of it is actively harming the evidence base because they're they're not the studies are badly designed badly reported and it's not the neutral actually they actually distort the overall evidence base in away from the truth so stop doing it stop writing uh, papers I, i'm with you completely because it, it wastes time goodwill emotional investment and funding one of my absolute bugbears something that really gets my goat is shit research and there's a lot of shit research out there so much poor uncontrolled poor quality you know case series because a prof or somebody says look at my last 100 of these i'm really good oh we did we all did it i mean uh, crikey you know looking back at some of the stuff i'm publishing it's just embarrassing but um and we've all been there but i think that it was a pressure on people to do that work and i was part of the problem you know about when i first there still is a pressure there still is a pressure and there's more and more journals and places you can put it so it's almost like the the marketplace the journal marketplace has got busier and busier um, and so you got. It feels like not you guys. Uh, the, the journals are almost competing with mm. each other uh, for, for for decent quality articles. It's not a popular view, but I'm absolutely convinced that the world would be a better place if ninety percent of all the journals didn't exist, because it's rubbish. It's actively distorting the the literature. Yeah. Um, See, the challenge is then. So one of the bugbears people have, and so there are a lot of there are people who consider themselves to be academic. There are people who consider to be jobbing surgeons. You know, and proper surgeons, yeah. proper surgeons. <laughs> and, and the job surgeons will often say to you well what's the point because for every study that shows me this i've got five that sh- i can find you five that show me the other right and that that's harmful to the to to that so how do we stop people kind of churning out uh rubbish and redirect their efforts into something that's more righteous and valuable for the community how do we uh, do that yeah i mean you've got it. unfortunately there's money to be made in this people are paying to to publish stuff now oh. so the journals actually make money from it so it's very difficult you can't turn that off but I think if we it, stopping the trainees from having to publish five papers, or whatever it is, you know, before they became a consultant, that's a big step sort of forward. And and the collaborative authorship thing, I think, is massive, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Because the, then they get recognition for for their work, but in a in a hopefully a good piece of it, in a good journal that people do want to read and, and take notice of. So I think that's really important. But yeah, I don't know how we get rid of them. It'd be great just to wipe them off the face of the earth. But Dan, have you got any thoughts on this? No, I, I, some of my early work was awful. So one was <laughs> one was so bad it was even rejected by EFOR. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I've got about five podiums at EFOR. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you belittle me? I've never ever been to EFOR ever since, <laughs> ever again. You, you won't be welcome back there. <laughs> I, I always wondered who that was, the one, the one person who got rejected from EFOR. <laughs> I think I won a prize at EFOR once. No uh, way. I, I feel like it's devalued. <laughs> It's, it's staying on the TV. <laughs> but you guys are both, you know, on the editorial board for BJJ, but the Bone and Joint Journal, um, which is considered to be the, the highest echelon in the UK, at least. Um, in the world. In, 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 world. The, the, in the, the world. The, the, top, the top tier of, of British orthopedic journals. Mm-hmm. And yet, I think you would both agree that there are there are articles that get accepted, published, and, and put through as great research. But really they're not controlled they're not um there's no, no great comparison they are heaving with potential bias we don't we don't know what the bias is and so uh they, they actually can be very misleading yes. and in some ways they're unhelpful because you don't know whether they're, they're they're misleading or not they might be the truth they might be the opposite of the truth and uh, what, what do what do we do with that so i think it's really hard so so over the last few years i think the methods have really tightened up at the bjj so i, I think we've we've started publishing a lot better stuff so it's it's a lot if it's published now it's a lot more likely to be believable um that, than perhaps it was in the past we don't take case series we, we reject kind of 90 percent of stuff that comes in we just reject it straight away if we you know without even sending out to review so so we we're kind of cutthroat and ruthless now because we only want the best stuff but at the same time things do sneak through um uh, and and so as a reader, it, it can be difficult. And so so you do still need to be able to you know you what what you accept is only as good as the the, the reviewers and the, the associate editor that that reads it. So um so you as a as a reader you still know how you, as you still have to know how to understand the paper and how to yeah. to recognise it. But so I think that's still a key skill that trainees need. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're doing our bit to try and tighten the methods up as as, as much as we can. I, I've been working with Jonah for a long time now, and. Um, I think over the last um, sort of five or six years in particular, and Farris made a point uh, when he took over as editor in chief of um, a setting up a research methods group, which both Dan and I sort of sit on, just to really advise, help the reviewers in terms of the methods, because the methods are the key, isn't it? Mm. Um, yeah. 
So, yeah, I think it's tightened up. But is everything in the Bone and Joint Journal brilliant? No, of course, of course not. And, and the big challenge is that all of our big papers, um, but all of our big papers regularly go to the, the Lancet or New England Journal, right. one of the big five. So, so, so we, we try to... There are, name the five. Uh, uh, so BMJ, New England Journal, uh, JAMA, uh, Lancet, and Annals. The other one. Yeah, the, <laughs> the other one that we never publish in. Like the, the Annals of the American College. Or something. Oh, okay, not the Annals so, of the Royal College of Surgeons. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Because I've published there. I've that... published there too. It's amazing. <laughs> I can't remember what it was, but yeah. is that that paper you got rejected from? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the question? <laughs> uh, I, I, what was the so, question? So, Pete? so why go for these? Why go for these bigger? Why why not? Why not support your journal? Why not support your yeah, journal it's... and put it put it in there and say you know this is this is. Well, so, so we want to support our journal. So, so we're, we're, we're quite. Um, so, so we, we want to put it in the big five journals because that's what the university kind of recognise and respects. So, so as as academics, we're judged by what's called impact, and yeah. that's not impact factor. It's about the the impact that your work has. So, so if if you can demonstrate that you've published a study and that study's changed practice, um, so reduced the amount of, of plates that are put in, etc., then then the university. Um, uh, c kind of gets assessed on on how much impact they make to society, and that that determines university's funding. Um, oh. So there's there's real big um, that th it's really really important to publish it in places that are likely to be you, you're likely to get maximum impact. And those big journals um, are the ones that that if you if your work's rigorous rigorous enough to get in those big journals, they're the ones that nice particularly and like the big uh, the big regulators really take notice of. So we want to get into those big journals because. People are like to believe the result a lot more. You know the 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 the, the methodological rigors. Everyone knows it's really really tight to get in those journals. But if we don't get it into one of those big five journals, then generally my first port call now is is the BJJ. So I, I don't go fishing for other journals. It's yeah. BJJ, and if it's not going in there, and then it's going to be uh, BJ Open. So Dan, talking about impact, it's interesting you mentioned impact because everything's about impact these days. It's about community public engagement, patient involvement. Yeah. The thing that's, I, I'm curious because things are evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain podcasts better than this. There are, uh, Linda Mason did a video for us for AuthorHub about posture major approach to the ankle. It's had 12,000 views. I would suggest that that's more people have seen that than would ever have seen him talk about it on a podium or ever would have read it in a paper. So uh, what, how, do we, how do we measure impact going forward? Do you think there's going to be less focus on papers and publications? Uh, so, so th there's obviously a lot of different ways to 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 get your message out and things. In terms of measuring impact, it, it's it's so it's all very well for someone watching it, but that's not the impact. The impact is you know someone taking that and using it in practice, and and that actually making a difference to patients, that, that mm. having a real patient value. Uh, and so that's why it's in increasingly important that we measure patient reported outcomes routinely, and you know we we record in registries and things exactly what we're doing because that's how we're. Are going to demonstrate so it's the impact to the patient not the impact to the surgeon or you know the the, the impact of watching the video it's it's actually what what difference is it making to society and that's that's what impact we need to measure but it can be challenging knowing how, knowing how to do that but i just think with the 21st century with modern technology there's just other ways of i think things there are things more impactful than journal articles well, it's something, yeah, and I, you know, I, again, and Dan, you know, has helped me push this sort of forward of my thinking. And I, you know, I, I was guilty. I think many of us were of putting the paper out in the journal, and expecting everyone just to to pick it up and use the evidence. So why wouldn't they? And of course, that's not really how it works. So mm. we now do it an awful lot more. And I'm not a big fan on social media, as you gather, but we, the group put a lot out there. And one of the really helpful things we've done recently, which I think was your idea, wasn't it, was the explainer videos. Yeah, yeah. So we do these little animated two minute, three minute explainer videos. And we started off, the, it was for lay distribution. So it's trying to get the message to the patients directly mm. in an in a easy format. And what we discovered was that that works just as well for surgeons and for everyone else. So now the explainer video, you just press play and that, that is the presentation where you don't have to listen to me waffle on at all. You, you get you know, a little animation showing exactly what we did and why we did it and how yeah. it affects practice. <clears throat> and that's huge. So you're absolutely right, Kirsty. You know, the bit in the paper is just the beginning of the process of mm. distributing it. Yeah. Measuring impact is really, really important, but it's, it's very difficult. So one of the few papers we actually wrote was actually looking after the draft trial at the impact of the change in practice. And because mm. of the coding it has, we were able to get reasonable quality data regarding the change in practice for plates and wires for wrist fractures and actually show quite a big change in practice. And that was, I was quite amazed because that got picked up by NHR and actually used as an example of how their research actually changed clinical practice. And that was an orthopedic 
studies, and that's yeah. quite amazing. But how little has actually been done on the genuine impact of research. Well, yeah, it's only recently we've had that option. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the data for many areas of, of the research we do, the routine data is just not good enough to, to really measure change in practice. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, Pete was going to ask a question about stats, so I'm just going to zone out while he does that. <laughs> 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 or yours, my friend. Okay, I'm going to have to come clean here. I, I often, and this does happen quite often, I'm reading an article and I get to the methods section and we get into the, into the stats and it's like, it's like you get this paragraph where I really can't really understand any of it. And I, I, obviously I'm probably worse than most, but that must happen to other people as well. Didn't you get that massive grant? I didn't confess that you didn't understand that. You've got to, you got to let did. that go, Matt, because he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you put the decimal point in the right place. <laughs> sort of three pounds. <laughs> uh, but that must happen to a large swathe of the community. Is that is that you know I don't know what a Bonfiori correction is, and so and Bonfiori. Exactly. <laughs> no, 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 it's not this. The Bonfiori. <laughs> a Bon Jovi correction. <laughs> I'll tell you about that later. Live another dream. Well, what, Live one a prayer. <laughs> <laughs> We're halfway there. You could play that now. As a reader. <laughs> As a reader of of of, of uh, orthopedic literature, and indeed as a reviewer, because often we get we get asked asked to review review articles, and you get to that bit in the set methods, and you think, if I'm honest, I don't, I can't really throw an opinion on whether this is the right stats or the wrong stats to be doing. So, how do we how do we get around that? So I think one of the big things is is so if your research is done properly, then then you usually got a statistician on board who who's doing that, and 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 actually statisticians generally use fairly simple tests because because we plan all of an, our analysis up front and we say look you know in trials essentially what we do is a t test we just compare the two outcomes and to to, to look at what's going on the, the really complicated statistics tends to be by people that that don't actually know what they're doing themselves. Um, so, so, so you know when you're a trainee that that you your boss gave you a set of data or your boss made you get some data and you were desperate to find find a p value using any of those buttons on that 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 statistical <laughs> thing that you had. And so in the end, you pressed all the buttons and and one random test that you've got no idea what what it was um, gave you a positive result. Um, and that's obviously yeah, and that comes back to the last thing that we want to stop trainees doing all the you know d doing that sort of work because it's not it's not helping anyone. Uh, and so so I kind of. I think it's very unlikely using all those kind of all those weird tests if if the person doing the the test actually understands it either, uh, and and so yeah, so I think statisticians should be you know we need to start planning everything properly involving statisticians and actually the the amount of the amount of spurious tests will actually come down hugely because statisticians are really kind of simple straightforward people and don't use all that rubbish. Right. So, so does does the BJJ run run each one each one of these things through a statistician so that so that the clinicians aren't necessarily uh, being asked to judge that element of it? Uh, so so we don't we we've got if there's any if there's any particularly challenging stats and um, we do have a, a methodology board as Matt said yeah. so and so Farris will send us any of the more complicated papers to run by the methods board and and sometimes you know the, the uh, on that there's a, a few of us kind of methods guys. But there's also a statistician, a health economist, to, so we can get like really expert reviews yeah, if if we need them. But yeah. on the whole, you, you know, I, our biggest advice would be just to keep the stats simple, um, because most things don't need complicated statistics. Chi squared covers most things, right? Exactly. Like but 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 it is just like that, you know, chi squared and t test. Well, what, yeah. what if you're doing anything more complicated? Unless you're a statistician, it's probably wrong. Yeah. Right. Oh, we do. I mean, the, the reviewing process, well, supporting reviewers has been, that's changed a lot. I think, mm. then Joint Journal, obviously, but I think many of the journals. So, it, and the truth of the matter is, none of us are statisticians. I don't do any stats these days because I work with professional people that do that. But um, if you don't understand the stats when you're reviewing the paper, just say, I don't get it. And then we can ask one of the statisticians to have a look. So yeah. it, it's much easier for the associate editor to, to when you're writing a review, saying, listen, I don't understand this. Um, can you get someone to have a look? And we'll go, oh, yeah, rather than pretend you do or make yeah, something yeah. up about it or <laughs> yeah so yeah that, that causes much more problems and so. i do think that if you involve statos from the very beginning i think the quality of research would be improved significantly yeah that i mean it, it, well you can't i mean we can't get funding well, you guys know you can't get funding unless you've got you know the full team of the researchers of which the clinicians are a tiny part mm. yeah uh, pretty important we like to think but um no actually the, the research is designed and to a large degree the analysis planned 
before we even put the grant application. Well, it has to be put in part of the grant application. Mm. So everything's done prospectively. And we publish the statistical analysis plan before we even recruit the patients so that everyone knows what we plan to do and then we, we do what we said we do. So, so we, we, we've even got the little tables drawn. So, so like, you, you, know, you can pretty much write the final paper except the result. Um, and it's all done like right at the beginning. So all the, all the statistician has to do in theory is just click go at the end and, and you should have a result within about 20 seconds. I mean, it's not quite, quite that simple, but, but that's how, how we set it up. Yeah. So. And that, you're absolutely right though. That should, be, that should be the process for every bit of research. And, Collecting data and then running some postdoc analysis mm -hmm. is a recipe for producing more crap. Yeah, I, I would suggest you that still happens for a lot of publications. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, uh, and we're trying to nudge, you know, the, so, the whole so, community away from that. So right, so, so let's just let's just revisit that one. How do we nudge the community away from that one? I mean, it's, it's nice that trainees are now able to get credit for for recruiting as opposed to just churning out rubbish. Uh, but how do we get consult, you know, like bosses away from? drawing together their last 15 cases of whatever it is yeah well i think i mean most of the bosses never don't write like that they get the trainees to do it so i think the trainees are the key and changing the mindset and hopefully there's now a generation of people coming through training that haven't had to write up that crap for their boss and the boss you know what it's like you never get around to actually writing up your own series you can yeah. try and get someone else to do it so if the trainees stop doing it then hopefully that will reduce well, the drive for, for that sort of work. And in order to be certified, board certified as it were now, you've got to have done a research methodology course, a good clinical practice course. So there are ch uh, balances and checks in place now. Yeah. yeah. But I, I agree to you, but, I, but they're, they're still there. The thing there is, is it, also, there is also, sorry to interrupt, there is also a, a, a uh, an institutional pride thing going on as well, isn't it? We want yeah. our centre to be producing great research and blah, blah, blah. Everyone wants that, you know, their institutional stamp on whatever it is they're doing. Uh, and we sort of need to get away from that as well, don't we? Get, get, get the ego out of it. But, but I think that's where we need to make the ego rather our institutions, uh, like our country. So, so I, I know this goes out all over the world, but, but the UK, UK orthopedic research is the best in the world. Um, and we're, you Undoubtedly. Know, Canada was the best, but now we're now beating them. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mo. Yeah. Um, but we're now, we're <laughs> Mo's riding a mountain bike somewhere. He's not listening to this. <laughs> so, so we're now beating them. And I, I think we need to, to be, yeah, as, a, as a group, we're far stronger than as an individual, you know, as an individual center. So, so we need to, so rather than the kind of having the competition amongst ourselves we need to have a competition who can recruit the most patients to trials because that's way more impactful than than anything you're going to do in your individual center so a lot of people would say that you two in your ivory towers uh, are sorted because you've got statisticians most people haven't so is the uh, are you suggesting the answer is that, that we we set up these trials centrally but then people recruit to them but unless, but but the people who have the statisticians are the ones who are doing all the analysis yeah that's exactly how it works yeah so the way this was all part of the, the learning curve about developing the networks for delivering the research because it didn't really exist until NHR did and it's only 2006 when it came into existence and and that in order for people to make it we had to make it as easy as possible for busy people busy surgeons to, to recruit into the studies which meant doing all the paperwork for them writing all the applications filling out all the ethics stuff uh, behind the scenes but also engaging professional trialists and trial administrators and data clerks as well as statisticians and health economists from from the beginning so all the all of the background work is done behind the scenes so that but essentially what the clinicians are now doing is doing their day job which is talking to patients about options for treatment and then delivering those interventions the fact that they've been randomized to one or the other you know it, it, you know many certainly my colleagues now it's much easier just to randomize a patient than to have me nagging them about why they didn't randomize it and mm. it's become so embedded in our our department's yeah. culture and i think that's happening more and more around the around the country and it's just making it easy for people is part absolutely of and I, I think you personally take a lot of credit for that and, and well, but you both do but i think it was you you were the one who popularized it in the uk and i think you know when when uh, when you and i were growing up as trainees uh, there was no culture of re recruiting to trials and now there really is it's just part of normal practice and i, I don't think people feel any any like sense of uh, loss uh, recruiting for some or, or a, a need to be acknowledged in somebody else's study. We just we just recruit because that's what we're doing. I mean, talking about acknowledging things, we we should say in, in all seriousness, it was the COTS guys, the Canadian Orthopaedic Trauma Society, that that model of collaborative research, where they all got together and decided what question they were going to answer, and then all collaborated to do that. Mm. We absolutely and and blatantly copied their their model and their their ideas in there. 
It's just we we now got we know better doing it. Better. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Which because NIHR have set up a national system now it, it embedded in all the hospitals it's, where where yeah. you can just add a, add another trial on top and it, and it, it well can we run. should I mean we should really acknowledge that I mean the infrastructure to deliver the research in the UK is is unique it's amazing so and it's funny you're talking to states and they still talk about our socialised healthcare system but having a, a national health service with a national health research infrastructure embedded within it and properly funded is almost unique so we are it's no it's not an accident that we've been able to deliver much larger scale research involving nearly all the hospitals in fact all the hospitals now isn't it around the country yeah it's it's due to planning of some very clever people who set up nhr yeah i mean that's impressive we'll we'll just gloss over the 104 week wait that we discussed this morning (laughs) (laughs) now consult a meeting you you mentioned our ivory towers before though so so but but nhr do have a, a network around the country where where there are statisticians that are paid to 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 at least work up grant applications with you. So if you worked in in somewhere that that you know if you don't think there's a statistician available to you, then I promise you that that there is a statistician funded at a university close to you, who who's who's funded to help you work on a grant application, and that's what NHR pay for. So so everyone's got their own ivory tower. You've just got to seek it out, and you know it's it's available there for you on the NHR website. They're not going to do your postdoc analysis for you of mm. you know of your boss's last ten patients. But they will help you write a grant to, to get a really successful trial going. Yeah, but research, research design services are yeah. all around the country, which yeah. are the, the people employed to, to help you. But yeah. it's funny what you mentioned about um, uh, involving, you know, uh, recruiting to trials, because every single trial meeting we have, at least once or twice, someone goes, is someone from the research team here? And someone will ask about recruiting, recruiting to a trial, won't they? Yeah. Daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we live, it's become almost normal, it has, hasn't it? it has, you know, yeah, in, yeah. I think in many most hospitals. But I, but I wonder if that's just us because we're in teaching hospitals, and no, it's I, not the I, case I, in district general hospitals. I, 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 I certainly from the number of recruits that we get, you know, every day to even the kids' trials. You know, yeah. we, we're, we're constantly getting recruits, and it's not just for the, from the same centres; it's from all over the place. Is it? Um, right. And and that's you know, it's thanks to the, all the local all the local surgeons who are recruiting, but also the trainees because they're really really engaged in. You know, in pushing this network of, of recruiting, yeah, um, and that's that's large. Boss was all but one hospital, didn't he? Yeah, it was all but all but one hospital. Um, Are you going to name which no, one? No, no, yeah. no. So it's 143 <laughs> hospitals, and there was there was one. So every, so who I'm, are these scandals? Well, they're, they're in the northeast, but actually they're really good at recruiting. So so I'm not going to name them anymore because because <laughs> they're really really good at good at recruiting to trials. So Newcastle, they, they come on, board. Sunderland. <laughs> 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 Moving on. <laughs> So Cash has been mocking me about about my my recent uh, foray into 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 NIHR research, and I, so I got I got a big grant, uh, three million pounds to run a. a, a I wasn't going to bring this up genuinely. No, I know, I know, I know, yeah. but but you did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't good at it, but I brought it up twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's too it's good okay. opportunity to give you a it's kick. Okay. Here. It's okay. It's okay. I, I can I can handle it. Um, so I, I I got this grant and uh, and I. Uh, we we started randomising and uh, started trying to recruit and recruitment was pitiful. And one of the things I learned from you know that whole experience, there were a number of reasons why people couldn't recruit, but what I what it, it dawned on me progressively as as the trial went on and the recruitment was just way under target was that you at the outset you have to have your entire community of people who are random who are going to be recruiting patients. Your, your entire community has to be totally behind you and in it and, and up for it. Because along the way, you will have struggles in Hospital A and Hospital B and things won't happen quite as you would want them to. And in order to make it happen, the people in those hospitals have to be totally batting for it. Mm-hmm. And if there's any kind of sense of like... Well, I wasn't really up for this in the first place. I, you know, I kind of said yes, but you know, I'm, I'm still pretty lukewarm on it. If there's any degree of lukewarmness amongst those recruiters, it will, it will. It, there's a there's a tendency for it to fail. And no, I think that's where that's where partly where life went down. And I, I just so I guess my question to you is, how do you make sure that that your community is absolutely singing at the start, so that when you press the button. It actually goes. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's really difficult, um, and uh, and that's so a lot of it's the network that we've we've built up over time. So so Matt set up the well, so so the the OTA the OTS the OTS yes yeah. Uh, so the OTS was is the the adult orthopedic trauma society, isn't it? Who who look after who, who really got a really strong network of of clinicians really batting for research, uh, and and I know a lot of the trials that 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 we think about first kind of 
get get discussed at those sort of meetings and within kids it's the British Society of Children's Orthopaedic Surgery so we, we, we actively actively talk about all the trials that are going to come up and, uh, and and make sure that everyone's kind of in agreement you, you know there, there's always going to be some some uncertainty and that's part of the trial because you know if there wasn't uncertainty then it wouldn't be a good question to answer we'd just you know be we'd know the result so um so 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 I think we've got these these really active societies now that are really like really bashing for it in the, in the background, um, and then we, we do we do lots of silly things like um, we've got a WhatsApp group for a couple of my trials, uh, and there's like three hundred people on each of the WhatsApp groups, um, and and every time you get a recruit, you know there's lots of like oh amazing on you awesome, yeah, yeah. which is like uh, it's a, it's a bit corny, but it just keeps morale up so much, and I think it's really really important to do to do those things. We we do a bit on Twitter, which which when I did a trial in A and E was really really important because. ED doctors are really into Twitter, um, whereas orthopedic surgeons aren't aren't quite. They have loads of time on their hand in between yeah. patients, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but 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 it was working with the ED guys that really really taught me how yeah. important social they media big, was yeah. because they're just so into it, um, and so that really boosted recruitment in the ED trial. So yeah. so it's really important to have people engaged from the start, but then then to keep an incentivizing people and keep the morale up. Um, it's, it's totally. Helpful. I mean, we, it's uh, one of the big things again that we've sort of learned uh, over the years is is. Uh, engaging people at the beginning is so important teachers as you yeah. said and and so we do a lot of work now with research prioritization exercises where the get the clinicians together but actually with the patients as well ideally in the same room pre-covid we certainly did um to set the questions at the beginning to make the create the next research projects and and if people feel some ownership of the question then you would hope that they'll have ownership of the results at the end of it and change because they set the agenda, which is why, you know, it's back to that, I don't have any ideas. It's all what other people think we should answer next and then we'll work up a, a project for that. And if they own the question at the beginning, then, yeah, as I say, they'll, they'll hopefully own the results. Yeah. yeah. But it's difficult. The... It's, it's really tricky. Yeah. And, you know, some, some trials just don't work at some centres. You know, so one hospital recruit brilliantly to one study because it just seems to work and... And then something goes wrong, something falls down, they just don't recruit to the next one. You get, it's so difficult to predict. A, a lot of what we often embed in the trial as well is, is something called qualitative work, um, which no one really knows what, what that means. But what that means usually is that, that we, uh, we, we go and talk to the surgeons who are recruiting in different centres and try and explore what the challenges are with them recruiting and, uh, and basically learn from, learn from the experiences going on in each centre. Like sometimes that may be recording surgeons' consultations to see how they're actually trying to consent that person because they may be really rubbish at consent or they may not understand something properly, which completely puts the patient off. So, so we've oft, often got this sort of qualitative work that's embedded at the start of the trial to try and overcome any challenges um, that, that people may be having in recruitment. Yeah. And we can identify particular, particular themes that we can share with everyone else and say, look, you know, don't say, you know, don't say we're going to toss a coin because patients hate you saying that you're going to toss mm. a coin because that, that's making it too trivial. Mm. Um, you know, so, so, so Compute, kind of, computer randomization. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's all the little words that we kind of don't think are important, mm. but patients think are really, really important to, to, to turning them off research. Mm. Um, and and it's about getting that message across. So, so we're we're now good at research as a as a community, but we could be better. And, and we uh, and that's why we need to have kind of lessons in how to do consent. And and we all think we're really really good at consent because we consent people for operations all the time. But research consent is quite different. Uh, the the language you sort of use, yeah. you can easily put a patient off research or or influence what the you know what their choice is going to be. When when we all you know. W if, if if there's any uncertainty, we, we we need to offer a trial as the as the standard route. You know, well, I'm going to put you in a trial because because that's that's the right answer. Genuinely, we need to get Dr. Chris and Dr. Zand to do all the re consenting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, I, they're, they're amazing. Watch the video; it's, yeah. it's awesome. I'll I'll put a link. In. <laughs> okay. Look, for what it's worth, I thought I thought the life trial had a really important question. Genuinely, not taking it. And I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, can you just lift the mistake? What is big data? Just explain what it is. Uh, so big data is so so we've got better and better. Um, uh, as 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 we've got more technical, we collect a lot more information routinely. Um, so big data is generally routinely collected information that's stored somewhere electronically, um, and it was and often we answer questions using big data. So we may we may link up. Um, uh, we, we, we may uh, use a data set like the HES data set, so hospital episode statistics, who's been admitted to hospital, 
and you can link that data set to a, a completely different data set. So you may link it to, I don't know, Tesco club card data to see whether people who eat broccoli bought at Tesco are more likely to be admitted to hospital than someone who eats carrots or, you know, right. so, so we're, we're, we're using data to, 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 that's, that's collected for one purpose and we're, we're refashioning it to try and answer different questions often. Um, so we always have to remember that the, the, the sort of question we're often answering wasn't entirely the, what wasn't the intention of why the big data was created in the first place, which, which creates a lot of the problems with big data. Right. Uh, yeah, because you're sort of you're bringing your methodology secondarily rather than primarily. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, when we do the trials, we 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 we, we, we obviously design the whole trial around the specific question. But with big data, you're 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 yeah, you're you're, you're fudging it a wee bit. You're starting off with the data set, and then you're trying to figure out how you're going to get your answer out of that data set. So there's inherent that there's there's a lot of things you can't control for, even though you're trying adjust for them and do clever analyses and stuff you can't adjust for everything so so there's always going to be inherent bias when you're looking at big data how far are we away from <clears throat> doing an intervention a, a hip replacement a knee replacement something giving people an apple watch off they go we don't intervene at all the, all the all the telemetry all the monitoring comes back remotely it gets analyzed automatically and you get an answer to a question uh, I think I think we're closer and closer to that, and I think we probably could start doing that sort of stuff as long as the the information you're collecting, the telemetry data, was was actually important to patients. Mm. So so you've got to, you, you know you've got to make sure you're collecting the information that that actually matters because it's easy to collect. You know you can collect all sorts of data and stuff, but if it's of no real value, then then do, your question's not of of any real value. And, and that's certainly been where there's been an evolution in us our, our research in the last decade or two. Where it used to be, what mattered to the surgeon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's now why the X-rays look right. Look yeah, like yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The X-rays look amazing. I'm delighted with myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's an outstanding result. Yeah, oh, what absolutely. do you mean they can't bend their knee? Yeah, yeah. But you even tell the patient, don't you? You, you look at your X-ray and you say, "Oh my gosh, look, aren't you good?" You know, the patient may be having a little whinge. No, no, your X-ray's perfect. Yeah. It's fine. You, I might use this in the presentation. I might use this in the presentation. Yeah, and they go, <laughs> they go away happy, don't they? Because yeah. they're like, "Oh, the surgeon told me I was amazing." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like my mum does it. I'm like, yeah. you know, or they, he told me I was very good. You're like, yeah. well, what does that mean? How do you feel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's even when the surgeons the ask the patient, so it's, I mean. Uh, if you ask the patient how they're doing, they, most patients weirdly want to please their surgeon. Yeah, yeah. You kind of thought it should be the other way around. But, yeah. And it's totally totally great. And then you go and tell the receptionist or the nurse, actually, I'm bloody miserable. It's more painful now than it was before he, <laughs> he did my knee or my hip or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, so actually collecting the data independently, the patient reported data, the patient's reporting directly uh, electronically or from a distance without the clinicians being involved at all. It's actually really important because they give you the truth then. Uh, and that's one of the problems with, with doing the operations we do, don't we? So we invent a new operation, the patient comes back and tells me, oh, doctor, I'm amazing now. And they, they, they didn't, you know, they're just trying to please us. Yeah, and yeah. and, it, and it, it reinforces to us that, oh my gosh, this is such a good operation. And then when we actually do the trial, we're surprised that the result's not positive because our mm -hmm. patients keep telling us it's amazing. But but actually, perhaps, you know, perhaps we, we should have done a proper method in the first place. Yeah. Let's not do this on ACLs, seriously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the longer this goes, the longer this conversation goes on. Yeah. But there's all sorts of amazing trials, aren't there? The placebo, you know, the placebo trials where you do placebo surgery. I mean, that's, I've not done any of those, but that's really cool. Like, that's, that's proper, that's proper exciting. Yeah, research. those are also trying to prove that orthopedic surgery doesn't work. Oh, but, but, but they're trying to prove particular operations don't work. Yeah. The, the ones, the operations that you kind of always suspected probably didn't work, but, yeah. but all the patients kept telling you, I'm an amazing doctor. And you're like, really? We, you know, we, 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 we had a little shave inside. Do you yeah. really better? Yeah. <laughs> so, but some of them are beautiful. So the, 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 the big one, the, the first one um, about, uh, about knee arthroscopy in, in, in mildly arth osteoarthritic knees. So they, they put those patients to sleep um, and they, they asked for all the instruments in the right order. Um, uh, so they made the, the little holes in the knee. Uh, and they even splash patients with water um, just to just to uh, just to make it, you know the patients were all asleep they were anaesthetized but just in case they had any subconscious understanding of, of what was going on they 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 so so in, in 100 patients that all they did was just put little scars but but ask for everything in the in the right way the correct order splash the patients then wake them up and then there was absolutely no difference at all in the outcomes between those that had the intervention and those that didn't it's really cool that's an amazing trial the uh, yeah. the, the one david beard's uh, uh, trial from uh, one of our colleagues uh, uh, in oxford who did the shoulder arthroscopy and yeah. sort of placebo control beard, beard is a great guy yeah. top man and um one of, I don't know if it's even published. I probably shouldn't talk about this, but um, they they did some functional MR scanning of people's heads after the, afterwards, whether having had placebo surgery or the or the real deal, 
and the same bits of the brain were lighting up really in the in the people's heads so the placebo effect it's a very real thing um it's actually a, there's a physiological underpinning for but that but it is a perverse thing to consent someone for isn't it oh yeah yeah you have a 50 50 chance i think you need this operation but we're gonna because you've been listed for this operation yeah. but now what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, you've got a 50 percent chance of it actually going through yeah that is that is a bizarre so, thing so to cost a leap of fact uh, so you're suggesting we operate on everyone just do placebo surgery this is well it's it's the done. question that always comes up isn't it, yeah. yes, isn't it? And, uh, the only real problem is that uh, and this is why the nearly all of the placebo interventions are are minimally invasive yeah. things because the risk profile of those procedures is we think low although you've got to yeah. be a bit it's careful very low. it's very low it's very low it's extremely yeah. low particularly yeah. ACLs yeah. but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah um, it, and it's much more difficult then to justify that if you're doing a much bigger intervention where there's genuine morbidity associated with just the actual approach even. Yeah. So that's why we haven't really pushed that envelope too far uh, on the surgical side. You know, it, it's standard, obviously, in drug interventions to have yeah. a placebo arm. But it'd be great for your waiting list. Yeah, yeah, it would. You could do loads of placebo operations in a day. Yeah, you get through yeah. them way quicker. The managers would be so happy with yeah, you. Yeah, twenty cases a day. Yeah. You'd be running out of water to splash their face. <laughs> There'd be a water shortage, right? Hose pipe ban. Cut out the middle man and just in clinic with a hose. There you go. You're all better. You're all better. Yeah. Healing water. <laughs> Holy water. <laughs> Uh, what's the next big thing in 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 in, in, orthopedic, in in research in general, but in orthopedic research, where where are we taking it? If, if it's not Apple Watches, what's it going to be? So so for me, so so um so I think it's going to be um so, so you talked about big data, and I think it's going to be a fusion between clinical trials and big data, and starting to randomise kind of routinely within uh, within big data sets. Uh, and so so one of the ways I'm starting to do that at the moment is is around hip screening. Um, so. Um, so w when babies are born, all their hips are wiggled, um, and we've probably all wiggled the baby's hips. The Ortolani and yeah, the, uh, exactly. What's the other one? The one who's a big Barlow. Of the beat. Barlow, Barlow, yeah. Barlow, because he's a bad guy. At, Barlow at the back. Barlow's a Ortolani out. Barlow's a bastard. He dislocates yeah. hips. That's yeah. how you remember it. Yeah. So Ortolani's <laughs> a good guy. Was Was Barlow really a bad guy though? I don't know, but he dislocated hips. He pushed him out. <laughs> I mean, he's Ort a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> Ortolani, we love it. <laughs> he's a nice guy. He flicks him back. Put the back in. Awesome. At the back. <laughs> <laughs> so what was I saying? Oh. But um, but so so we, we so so loads of people wiggle those babies' hips, and no one's actually got any idea if 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 like that that whole test is done by junior doctors and by people that they've never felt a dislocated hip in their entire life, and that yeah. that examination is completely pointless. Completely. And the National Screening Committee say that this examination is pointless, um, and and it doesn't you know we missed two thirds of two cases of dislocated hips, but but we can't stop that examination because it's just kind of impossible. And we need to do something better than that. Um, and what kids orthopedic surgeons want to do is they want to routinely ultrasound everyone's hips, which um, which they do in many parts of Europe. Um, so, so, but, but what there is is a national screening system called Smartphone IP, where they record the examination um, findings and and uh, record the outcomes, so the ultimate um, uh, outcomes of ultrasound for, for dislocated hips. And it'd be really, really cool if we could start to randomise within those sort of big data sets. So you, so you randomise people to ultrasound scan or not an ultrasound scan, and then you get a really definitive answer kind of a bit like your apple watch because it's just kind of normal practice that you know everything else is just kind of happening routinely you know all the data collection is happening routinely uh, and so that's that's where i've just been given some funding to to kind of see if i can make that happen um because we can get some really cool um answers for for kids really quickly if we can if we can do that sort of stuff and with Matt's stuff you know potentially you could do randomized within nhfd so the national hip fracture database that'd be really cool hmm. um so matt dan's told us kind of what his dream trial is What's yours? What's the one you want to do before you retire? Um, so again, it's not my idea. So it's answering other people's questions. There really, must be one you, of your own that's burning well, away. I think the, not the, Achilles tendon. The one definitely not Achilles. Done that. <laughs> ACL spent thirty years with. Oh, hey. <laughs> so, yeah, got to do ACL. <laughs> got, to, got to get rid of the ACL. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, for me, the really exciting stuff would be if we can do some proper global health work in, in orthopedics, which has almost not really been done really so particularly low middle income countries and i think the big interventions there are actually not the surgery it's the multidisciplinary care it's the pathway changes mm. so we, we've got a bit of work a load of propriety work we've done over the last about four years actually um trying to work out what the current systems are for delivering something common like hip fracture care in, in various parts other parts of the world and then try to intervene to change pathways um i think that that you know we if we're honest with the surgery we're tinkering we're tinkering with the yeah, interventions, yeah. you know, and we're yeah. saving a few quid here and there maybe and changing a few outcomes for a relatively small number of people. But yeah. 
you know, in, in huge parts of the world, they have no access to surgery at all. So, you know, can we can we influence that? That would be that would be cool. Well, trauma is the yeah. biggest killer, isn't it? Low middle low and middle income countries, the biggest killer. Absolutely. I mean, we spend. You know, it's really interesting. I mean, the change in in attitudes really towards trauma in the UK over the last ten or fifteen years has been amazing because it did used to be the poor relation, and there's yeah. no doubt about it. Um, but actually, in most parts of the world, it is the problem. Trauma is the yeah, problem. Well, it's you know, a arthritis disease. isn't. It, trauma is know. a disease, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And the big, as you said, the biggest killer in under forties in the in the world is trauma. And you know, and that's that's got nothing to do with the with the morbidity of trauma, uh, with, with with a disability and you know, inability to return to work. Except. Well, it's fascinating when you when you see all those studies. You go, well, if you add up malaria and HIV and everything combined, trauma is kind of double, triple that. And yet, look how much money just goes into malaria from. Well, do you, I mean, gate. some of the most impactful, probably the single most impactful thing that I think I've certainly been involved with was the, was the quality of life data we did for the hip fracture patients, just finally showing that actually after a hip fracture from the injury, you have a permanent reduction in quality of life equivalent to having a stroke. And no one believed us. And you think how much money went into stroke research, and yet 70,000 patients a year in just the UK were having an equivalent hit on their quality of life, and yet what research was done in in hip fracture nothing so yeah. the scale of the problem is um you know establishing the scale of the problem that was probably the most useful thing we did and if you look at the demographics of of uh, south america and, and south asia in particular the tsunami of fragility fractures is just about to topple over them and their healthcare economies almost invariably won't cope mm. with that so changing the way we look after older people with fractures is, is going to be massive so Simon Graham, who's a, who's a researcher um, uh, in, in, glo- in a lot of global health stuff, he talks a lot about trying to unpack trauma. So, so we all talk about trauma and it's kind of trauma research and stuff. Um, uh, and, and in a way, many years ago, the, the infectious diseases guys used to talk about infection and then they learned to unpack an infection to kind of all the, 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 all the individual diseases, so malaria and you know, everything else. And Kinga Kingeli. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a fascinating, fascinating thing. I, I read your paper. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you were the one who read that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was telling a story. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so anyway, if you start to unpack it, then, then you get, it, it's a lot easier for people to, to kind of grab onto it and funding bodies to, to grab onto things. So we've got to learn a bit better how to unpack trauma. Because at the moment, trauma is left as this kind of, this blanket kind of thing that's hanging there that funding bodies don't know how to unpack and we need to try and help them unpack it to to make it into manageable chunks that we can then get Bill Gates or someone else to to start funding bits of it like hip fracture major trauma or or how are we going to unpack it but we we need to clearly unpack it for the for the big funders in, in the global setting absolutely um now Pete asked me not to to rant um before yeah. he said <laughs> here he goes yeah, you so, so this is this is not a rant um in any way but you know Journals but it's going to it's going to sound a bit like it's a rant. Sound no, like a rant. It's definitely no, not. No, no, I've been quite measured. But um, journals, let's be honest, they're a scam, right? They control the market. You've got to pay to access them for a lot of them. Often they're outside your institutional access. So someone's paid for you to have access, and you're still going to pay for this journal. Then sometimes increasingly you've got to pay to publish. They don't pay the reviewers. They pay the editors a pittance, right? And then at the end of it, uh, they keep all the profit newspaper uh, uh, magazines are dying now print wise what's the future for journals uh, i mean it's it's on it's online isn't it i mean it is i mean most of the journals are now you, you know even the bjj which is uh, because it's independent of the big publishers i mean it's kind of why people like dan and myself give up a lot of time for it because it's actually it, it's it's not owned by one it's a it's its own business it's um, run on a not for profit basis by and owned by the editorial board so it's the degree of independence, but even the Bone Joint Journal, which has not necessarily been at the, historically at the cutting edge of you know how to deliver the message, it was a print journal that dropped through your door and you either read it or you didn't. Um, they're moving towards using multimedia approaches, so all the infographics and the you know the podcasts that those guys have been doing as well, um, and that is the way forward, isn't it? So the print version is just the beginning. Uh, you know, you, you you need some formal mechanism for review and of quality control. So there'll be some element of the journal function to establish what's good research and what's not will have to remain. But the bit of writing that appeared on the page is a tiny part of the future. I think that everything else will be delivered through through uh, multimedia platforms yeah. and particularly visual because yeah. it's so much easier to pick up those explainer yeah. videos, those lay explainer videos. It, it's so much more engaging for the for the audience yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> than yeah. listen to me or Dan or yourselves like waffling. No, I, I was being devil's advocate. I love the Bone and Joint Journal if Faris is listening. Um, <laughs> um, Dan, have you got anything to add? 
Uh, so, I, I mean, it comes back to the previous thing about not publishing, you know, don't, don't publish crap research because you know, that's what's keeping these predatory journals going. You know, it's you, you paying 700 quid or however much it is to, to get it in those, those bad journals. You know, the yeah. Bone and Joint Journal um, still publishes um, uh, things for, for free, um, albeit behind a paywall, but, but certainly within the UK, we've, we've all got access to that as part of the, you know, the part of the BOA and stuff. So, so publish it in decent places. And if it's not going to get published in decent places, then then, then perhaps it shouldn't be published. Don't publish that's it. controversial. Yeah. Perhaps. No, no, I, <laughs> I, I think that's an entirely fair point. Yep. So, uh, and, the, and the reason, so for us, the reason that we, we pay to, we pay to publish stuff um, is because, so that's it's all part of the NHR, the big funders. They they give us the cash to 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 make this freely available because we want it to be available to the people. We don't want, you know, we, we don't want research behind firewalls because we want the we want the public to be able to read it and be able to be empowered to to, to you know to know what's going on with their healthcare and things. So that's the reason why you know that's the argument for for paying to to have it you know to, to have it up front there. And that's why the you know, more and more the the funding bodies are saying actually you can't you can't publish in. Uh, in any journals at all, unless everything that they have, they, they, they're they going to have, is completely open access. Mm. And that's the kind of direction we're moving, and, that, and that's going to be hard for the Bone and Joint Journal to to kind of work out how it's going to how it's going to adopt that model. But that's how you disseminate ideas globally. Yeah, no, absolutely. Oh, it's got to be open yeah. access, because, yeah, you know, the, the cost yeah. of the, the journal is unreachable for a surgeon in the Philippines, never mind a, a yeah. nurse in the... Mm. Yeah, right. So, yep. it's um, yeah, it's got to be open access, and if that means that means the researchers paying uh, to have their work disseminated, and the NHR actually allow us to put that in the budget to to have that money, and it's yeah, yeah, the big thing was it five grand that that's yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's not expensive. it's not a small amount of money, mm. right? So, but it's worth it because you get that reach. Yeah. And that I mean, that's the only reason I haven't published in the Lancet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Out of sheer principle. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, have you got anything to add? I've got nothing to add. Matt, anything else? No, that was good. That was really cool, guys. I enjoyed that much more than I thought I was. Yeah. And Dan, actually, think, Dan, um, you've, you've done our podcast and you've done the BJJ podcast. Which is yeah. better? Uh, so, so <laughs> they, they, they were both equally special in, in their own special ways. Yeah. <laughs> cop, out. Oh, cop out. Gentlemen, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us, particularly hungover. Uh, <laughs> where do we send the check? <laughs> Actually, well, one last thing. Do we are we paying you for? Yeah, that's right, yes. Are we paying to yeah, publish? Yeah, 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 no, the one last thing is we've we, yeah, we're paying we've going to give you your uh, author hub mugs to say thank you very oh, much awesome. for uh, coming down. Excellent, thank, thank you, very thank much. you. Well, super. Um, what an honour! It's like a yeah. Tommy Tippy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, cherish those and um, thank you very much. Thanks, oh, guys. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. We're really great for you coming down. Cheers. Cool. <laughs> thank you. Brilliant. Cheers, guys.